I welcome you to the launch of the Commission's most recent report, which is on suspended sentences. False. This is the Commission's first virtual launch of a publication. It is strange sitting here in isolation, facing a webcam, particularly when I reflect that just over nine months ago, I stood here addressing a room full of guests on the launch of the Commission's report on knowledge and belief concerning consent in rape law. Notwithstanding that, it is worth recording a significant similarity between that event last year and this launch. In my opening remarks at the November launch, I expressed gratitude to my colleague, Commissioner Tom O'Malley, the leading expert on sexual offences in this jurisdiction, for attending at the launch to explain the changes to the law recommended by the Commission in that report. At this launch, we are very fortunate that Commissioner O'Malley, who is also the leading expert um, on sentencing law in this jurisdiction, will explain the content and substance of the report being launched now and the recommendations made by the Commission in it. On behalf of the Commission, I also, and also on behalf of the public, for whom this launch will be made available online, I express sincere gratitude to Commissioner O'Malley for his participation in this virtual launch and for the very interesting and informative presentation you will hear very shortly. This report being launched is on a project which forms part of the Commission's fourth programme on of law reform, suspended sentences, under which the Commission was asked to examine the principles which the courts apply and should apply when deciding whether to impose a suspended sentence. The Commission published an issues paper on the project in 2017, which attracted many submissions from and consultations and discussions with individuals and bodies interested in this area of the law. In the report, the Commission acknowledges the valuable assistance it received through that process. I think it is important to emphasize, um, as I do frequently, um, the importance to the work of the Commission of consultation with the public and with relevant stakeholders. While while doing, it is virtu while doing it virtually is definitely not the same as doing it face to face. I want to express the gratitude of the Commission to those whose work resulted in this substantial and significant report. They are the principal legal researchers on the project, originally Hannah Byrne, who was replaced by Liam Dempsey, whose tremendous work has resulted in the report in its final form. The, director, the Deputy Director of Research, Dr. Robert Noonan, who not only filled the gap between the departure of Hannah and Liam taking over the role of Principal Legal Researcher, but guided Liam through the project. The Director of Research, Rebecca Cohen, who, since she joined the Commission in February this year, has made an enormous contribution to the completion of the report. Um, our full-time commissioner, Raymond Byrne, who is constantly available to assist the research team for each project and was so available to assist, to assist uh, for this project. And most importantly, in relation to this report, the coordination commissioner on the report, Commissioner O'Malley, for his input and his very committed oversight of the project over three years. Getting the report ready for printing and for launch on 31st August 2020 was particularly difficult in this unusual time of remote working and mainly virtual communications. I am very conscious of the effort required from our hardworking personnel in administration to get the report online, printed, and ready for launch. They are Reed Rogers, Head of Administration, Ger Mooney, and Gavin Walsh, who is mainly responsible for this video. On behalf of the Commission, I say 
thank you to each of them. Then, that the launch itself has happened is large, largely due to the effort and commitment of Orla Gillen, the Library and Information Manager, to whom I express the gratitude of the Commission. In conclusion, on behalf of the Commission, I express the hope that this important report on the reform of the law on suspended sentences will be of assistance to the, the Attorney General, the Government and the Oireachtas in their consideration of the implementation of the necessary changes to the law which have been ident identified in it. Commissioner O'Malley will now address you about the report. Thank you. 50 years ago, almost exactly, the Supreme Court described the suspended sentence as a valid and proper uh, form of penalty. That is a view that would today be very widely shared uh, among judges and lawyers in particular. Not, it must be said, a view that would be universally shared because there tends to be at times a view among the general public that the suspended sentence is something of a let off. Therefore, it is very important that we be clear uh, at the outset as to what exactly a suspended sentence is. So a suspended sentence is first and foremost a sentence of imprisonment. Uh, a term of imprisonment is imposed on the offender following conviction, but it is then suspended either fully or in part on condition that the uh, offender uh, abides by conditions uh, which will usually be uh, to the effect that the um, will include obviously a requirement that the offender doesn't commit any further crimes and they may have to abide by uh, other uh, conditions as well. So for that reason, um, it's important to be uh, clear that it is actually a punishment. The period for which um, a suspended sentence is imposed is called the operational period. And that uh, would be, for example, uh, an example would be if let's say a sentence were imposed for uh, of imprisonment of three years was imposed, uh, followed, or, or a sentence, I should say, of three years imposed, suspended for four years, well then uh, the operational period of that sentence is four years. And what that means is that throughout that four-year period, the offender is at risk of having to go to prison for three years if he or she breaches the terms of uh, suspension. And of course, the most likely way of doing that is by uh, committing uh, a further offence. Now, a, a suspended sentence can serve a number of purposes. Uh, first and foremost, it is a punishment in itself uh, by virtue of having the threat of imprisonment hanging over the person for whatever the operational period happens to be. Uh, but secondly, it can serve other purposes. It can be rehabilitative uh, in the sense that it uh, will usually involve, or may involve, in some cases at least, uh, the person being under some degree of su supervision from the probation service um, and perhaps getting other help uh, as well. Uh, and that's obviously very important. Secondly, it can be a deterrent because the person has the threat of imprisonment hanging over them uh, if they uh, engage in any further criminal conduct. So it is a form of specific deterrence, as we call it, in the sense that it deters that particular individual from committing any further crimes. Um, desistance, which you know, is really what, in a sense, is the ultimate objective here, desistance of further crime, is very much in the interests of society as it is in the interests of offenders, of the individual offender. And uh, there has been a great deal of study and research carried out into desistance over the last, um, let's say, 10 to 20 years. And two key findings of that research are, I suppose, particularly important for this purpose. The first is that if you have somebody who has a long history of offending, desistance, in the sense of stopping committing crime, is seldom an event. It's usually more of a process. The offender seldom suddenly stops short committing crime. Very often what they do is to slow down. They'll be committing crimes at lesser frequencies and hopefully as well, and in many cases, of lesser gravity. And the second finding connected with that is that what really encourages them to desist entirely eventually is that if they have a degree of internal commitment, but also if they have certain external supports. 
And what the research shows is that if, in fact, they know that somebody out there, uh, it may be somebody close to them or it may be some official, some person who is representing the state actually believes in them or shows that they believe in them, well, then that is likely to encourage resistance. And, of course, the imposition of a suspended sentence is in many ways uh, the best way, I suppose, that a court can show or that an individual judge can show that they believe in the offender's willingness and capacity to at least make a strong effort uh, to desist uh, from uh, further crime. So there are just some of the background issues uh, connected with the suspended sentence, and they, I suppose, show why it's a worthwhile uh, topic to research. So in this report, the Law Reform Commission has undertaken quite a detailed study of the principles that should govern the use of the suspended sentence. It's, that, that is what it's prim primarily concerned with. Um, the law itself is mostly set out in an act that was passed in 2006, the Criminal Justice Act, and it has been amended many times in the interim. But we are more concerned here with the principles that should govern judicial decisions to impose uh, suspended sentences. Now, it's a very long report, a detailed report, a comprehensive one, I hope. Uh, it runs to well over 300 pages. And all I can hope to do with this very short presentation is to uh, simply identify uh, and mention a few of the more salient themes that emerge in it. First point to note is that Ireland is quite unique, or it has a rather unique relationship with the suspended sentence, in that here it developed judicially. It was developed by the courts. We're not exactly sure when or which year, but it was in the late 19th or possibly early 20th century that uh, Irish courts began to develop the suspended sentence, whereas in all other countries that I'm aware of, uh, where it has developed, it was introduced by statute. So therefore, it had been in existence in this country, if you like, as a matter of common law or judgment law for possibly over a century before it was eventually put on a statutory footing in 2006. Partly as a result of that, there is a second feature of the suspended sentence in Ireland that is, again, I think unique internationally, uh, which is that in this country, a sentence of any length may be suspended, and it may be suspended for any period of time. Now, there's one very important limitation on that. Uh, a mandatory sentence, such as, let's say, the life sentence for murder, which is absolutely mandatory, can never be suspended. But any other term of imprisonment, what we call a determinate prison sentence, namely for a specific uh, period of time, can be suspended. We have considered that, and in our view, uh, that should remain. By the way, the Criminal Justice Act of 2006, the statute that I was referring to, that too permits a sentence of any length to be suspended. Now, it might seem strange that um, a sentence, let's say, of 10 years or 12 years imposed for a very serious offence would just be suspended. That, in fact, quite rarely happens. It's very, very rare for a sentence for a serious offence to be suspended in its entirety. Um, it has happened in the past, let's say, in relation to some manslaughter cases, but it would be quite uh, very rare today. It would be virtually practically unknown, for example, for a, a sentence for rape to be suspended in its entirety. What is much more common is for a sentence to be partly suspended. Now, that means that, let's say, a person will get a sentence of 10 years imprisonment, but perhaps the last two or three years um, suspended, again, on conditions. Uh, the offender will be released that bit earlier from prison, but it'll be subject, they will only be a conditional liberty, if you like, in the sense that it will only be uh, if they abide by the conditions that they can remain at liberty, otherwise they can be brought back uh, to serve out the balance of their sentence. Ever since the present Court of Appeal was established in 2014, it has been encouraging the use of part suspended sentences in certain circumstances, namely where it appears that the person in question, the offender in question, is capable of and, and willing to uh, engage in rehabilitation, that they want to reintegrate back into society, and therefore uh, the final part of a sentence is now occasionally, not at all uncommonly in fact, uh, suspended in order to incentivize people uh, to rehabilitate themselves 
And we again believe that that is uh, a good and a useful strategy. Uh, again, it goes back to the whole question of desistance, anything that will promote desistance from crime on the part of offenders, especially those that have uh, a significant record or that have committed serious crime, uh, is to be welcomed and is to be encouraged. Uh, so therefore, we would uh, not recommend that that aspect of the law be changed. What we do in uh, one of the central chapters in the report is to consider the kinds of factors that should influence a court in deciding whether or not to suspend a sentence of imprisonment. These largely reflect the existing law, but we hope that there is some value in setting them out and discussing them and so forth. The value of a, one of the values of a suspended sentence, whether it's in full or in part, is that the head sentence, what we call the headline sentence, uh, you know, reflects the, the degree of censure or the degree of reprobation or blame that the offender deserves for the crime in question. Obviously, there will be, um, there will be mitigation for any personal uh, factors that are in the offender's favour. But the suspended sentence then can reflect, um, if you like, particularly strong mitigating factors where it seems that the balance of justice, if you like, and sometimes the balance of humanity, uh, would favour suspending the sentence, as I say, either in its entirety or, or in part. So that's one of the things that we are, are, are doing there. Um, we have dealt with, um, in a particular chapter, we have dealt with the use of suspended sentences for, uh, for child offenders. I might say that when we started doing this report first, we had intended to concentrate on adult offenders only and concentrate on the suspension of sentences of imprisonment. Uh, children are, may, under no circumstances, ever be committed to prison. That is, a person under the age of 18, uh, as a result of the Children Act of 2001, may not, under any circumstances, be committed to prison. Instead, they can be sentenced to detention in a, child, in a children detention school, but even that is supposed to be a sanction of last resort, and it usually is, uh, except that, uh, and it usually is, I should say, without exception, but of course there will be cases where the offence is so serious that uh, detention is pretty much inevitable. However, we decided, having thought about it while, we, while the project was uh, going on, to, uh, to perhaps address this issue of suspending uh, sentences of detention. As it, as it happens, the Children Act doesn't permit that to happen. Uh, and there was a decision of the Court of Appeal some years ago where it has confirmed that as Irish law now stands, uh, a sentence of detention in a children, in just, a children detention school may not be suspended. So therefore, we were wondering, would it be a good idea to recommend that that should be introduced? Now, I should say that in the course of our deliberations on this report, we had two very, very useful uh, consultation seminars uh, with members of the legal professions and, and many other people, Gardaí, and many other people who have a lot of experience and expertise in this area. And one of those was devoted specifically to the whole question of whether uh, sentences of detention for child offenders should be introduced. The balance, in fact, I think the overwhelming view was that they should not be. And certainly I could understand why, and we eventually ended up supporting that view. Uh, it, the reason is this, essentially, that in particular with short periods of detention, that uh, if a child is to be sentenced at all, and this is very much part of the existing law, and indeed part of the existing social science, I might add, and criminology in relation to young offenders, it's very important that they should be dealt with as quickly as possible after the offence has been committed, that there shouldn't be any due delay in bringing the child to justice. And if they are convicted or if they plead guilty, there shouldn't be any delay in sentencing them. If they are sentenced to detention, well, then that should happen uh, again, like everything else, as soon as possible, because detention is meant to be uh, rehabilitative. It's not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be rehabilitative educational and so forth. But if a sentence of detention were suspended, uh, of course, it would have to be part of that arrangement that the child, if he or she breached the terms of suspension, 
uh, could be brought back to court and have the centres of detention reactivated. But that might be happening months, or perhaps in some cases, even a couple of years after the uh, original conviction. And all of the psychology of the law, the social science and so on, tells us that if um, penalties and other measures imposed on child offenders are to have any meaning and any effect, they should be imposed, as I've said already, as soon as possible after the crime has been committed. And therefore, in the kind of scenario that I've just mentioned, you could end up with a child uh, being sent to detention, let's say, um, you know, maybe months or perhaps even a couple of years after that. And that would break the kind of very important close temporal connection that should exist between the offence and punishment. So therefore, we're not recommending uh, that at this point uh, that sentences of detention should be capable of suspension. We're aware, however, that there is probably a review going on or that there may be a review going on in general of the Children Act of 2001. And that's particularly needed at the moment because uh, one of the things that has happened in the interim, unfortunately, uh, and this is something that hadn't even, he hadn't even really come to light when we had our, our consultation seminar, is that we have had a number of children who have been charged and convicted of very serious offences, including murder and attempted murder. Clearly, in those cases, the court will have to impose a significant sentence, in most cases at least, uh, of several years' detention. Now, of course, when the child reaches the age of 18, uh, or at least 18 and a half in some cases, they will have to be um, transferred to an adult custodial environment, effectively a prison. And uh, therefore, it could well be useful to have some system for suspending a, a, a part of part of a long term of imprisonment. There is already in existence a mechanism very similar to that, which is called the reviewable sentence, which courts have been willing to use, whereby, let's say, the court will impose on a child offender may be convicted of a very serious offence, uh, perhaps a sentence of 10 years, um, but reviewable after maybe seven years. Uh, now, what me that means that the child, will, of course, by then, he or she will in all likelihood be an adult, and as I say, held in a custodial, uh, an adult custodial setting. Uh, the, tr the person will be brought back to the court at that point, and the court will then have the opportunity to review how the person is doing, how the offender is doing, uh, are they responding to tre treatment and training or whatever facilities are available to them or have been available to them uh, while they have been in custody. And if the reports are favourable, if it looks as though the person in question doesn't pose a significant risk, if released, well, then the court could suspend the balance of the sentence at that point. That is something that the courts have effectively developed themselves. Uh, it's, um, there's no statutory basis for it. It's a practice, I should say, that is discouraged in the case of adult offenders. But we believe that it is a very useful mechanism to have for dealing with child offenders. And therefore, we would recommend uh, just in case there is any legal difficulty about it in the future, that um, the um, that uh, legislation would uh, be enacted that would, if you like, put that on a firm statutory basis. And we hope that that will happen. We have developed, or devoted, I should say, uh, another chapter in the report to the use of suspended sentences for white collar offenders. Now that, of course, is a term that's notoriously difficult to define as to what exactly a white-collar offender is, but usually you're talking about somebody who has been convicted of a non-violent crime, usually of a business or economic nature. Um, usually it would be a person uh, who has you know, some significant role, um, occupies a fairly significant or senior position in uh, some business organisation or in the public sector or whatever. And um, the suspended sentence will often be uh, used in those cases. For example, fraud is the clear example. Um, that could involve many different things. It can be small-scale fraud of an employee, for example, who steals from an employer. 
or you know it could be on a much larger scale as well all we can do really in this chapter is to kind of elucidate i suppose some of the issues that arise in that regard um if you were to look at white collar offenders uh, generally i mean very often they're the kind of people who would qualify for a suspended sentence because they will usually have strong mitigating factors going for them in terms of not having any previous convictions having previously be a positive good character uh, they may have paid back some or all of the money that they took and so forth the difficulty of course is trying to introduce a measure of equity into the system uh, to ensure that you know white collar offenders are not if you like unduly unfavorably treated or treated uh, sorry i should say that they are not unduly favorably treated compared to what you might call ordinary or conventional offenders in other words people who haven't had the opportunities in life who haven't had the success uh, or who haven't had the status uh, of those who fall in typically fall into the white collar category so the challenge really is to try to ensure that the suspended sentence should continue to be available uh, well for all offenses except those carrying mandatory penalties we're not suggesting for a moment that it should be abolished for white collar offenders because if only because it's such a difficult term to identify or to, to uh, delimit or define in the first place. Uh, but what we are suggesting is that courts should, and no doubt they do, uh, when imposing sentences on white collar offenders, have regard to the seriousness of the offence as well, and that there shouldn't be any presumption, and which there isn't, I should hasten to add, that such an offender uh, should get a suspended sentence rather than immediate custody. There may be some such cases, as there is right across the board, where a fully suspended sentence would be appropriate. But in many cases, it may be that a partly suspended sentence uh, is appropriate there. The final aspect of the report I just want to mention, uh, again, has to do with procedure. I'll just deal with this rather briefly. Um, the, as I say, the Criminal Justice Act of 2006 uh, was mainly concerned, well, it, it put the suspended sentence on the statutory footing, but it was mainly concerned with trying to put in place an effective system for the revocation of suspended sentences. In other words, to deal with situations where the offender had not, in fact, abided by the terms of the, uh, of the um, suspended sentence, uh, principally by committing another offence in the vast majority of cases. And it was designed to ensure that uh, such a person would be routinely uh, brought back before court in order to be dealt with and that the suspended sentence could be activated. I should say, just as a, an aside here, that when it comes to reactivating a suspended sentence, whether it has been, whether it's a full or a part suspended sentence, a court does have some degree of discretion uh, in that it, if, the, if, the, um, if the violation involved was very minor, uh, well then a court could simply ignore it. Otherwise, if the person has committed an offence in the meantime, and especially if it's an offence of any degree of gravity, a court will probably um, reactivate the suspended sentence and the person will have to serve that in addition to whatever sentence they're given for the new offence. However, when it comes to that point, the court doesn't have to reactivate the original suspended sentence in its entirety. It can do so in full or in part, uh, so that very often the court might be of the view that it would be unjust at that point, given that the person might have been uh, compliant, if you like, with, this, with the suspended sentence throughout most of it, if they committed a new offence, let's say, towards the end of it, well, then a court would normally, and indeed it would be uh, required, they would be required as a matter of principle uh, to just activate the sentence in part. But the person would still end up having to serve some, uh, some uh, part of the sentence uh, which, they, which had originally been suspended. As I say, the, the purpose of the 2006 Act uh, was uh, mainly to... Um, uh, deal with that issue, uh, and it has worked fairly well. There have been there have been certainly a lot of 
legal problems that have arisen with it. it the legislation had to be enacted or had to be um, amended, I should say, a few times. Uh, and overall, at the moment, it seems to be working fairly well. What we are concerned about, however, is to ensure that uh, there should be an adequate information system in place to ensure that all of the different parties involved, and they will very often include uh, the probation service, the Gardaí, the Director of Public Prosecutions, the courts, and so on, uh, that they're able to identify those who have breached the terms of their suspension uh, quite quickly and easily, and uh, so that the person can be brought back before court if necessary. To do that, we need a more joined up uh, system of both collecting information and also sharing it within the relevant agencies. And therefore, a significant part of what we're doing in one of the chapters of this report is making recommendations for a much greater uh, degree of urgency in developing uh, a proper information system in that regard. Now, we acknowledge that a good deal has already been done and is being done, but we certainly want to encourage that and to promote it further if we can. That then is just a flavour of what the report contains. I suppose it's true to say that uh, in this country, as in so many other countries over the past 10, 15, 20 years or so, uh, there has been a great deal of emphasis and renewed interest in the development of a more structured sentencing system uh, to try to ensure that there is consistency of approach in the selection of sentence. Not, we're not talking here about uniformity of outcome, but just that there is consistency of approach. And that is reflected, for example, in this country in the various guideline judgments that have been delivered by the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court uh, in recent years, even more strongly reflected, obviously, in the provisions of the Judicial Council Act of 2019 uh, that set up a sentencing guidelines and information committee that will be responsible for developing guidelines uh, for various offences and about sentencing generally. And that uh, general trend towards more coherent and structured sentencing, I think, for the most part, is welcome. And we hope that this report uh, will make its contribution in that regard, that it will be of assistance to lawyers and to judges in developing further and applying uh, the principles that should govern the appropriate and proportionate use of uh, suspended sentences. And uh, we hope that it will also uh, help to uh, promote public understanding of the suspended sentence as a penalty and of the purposes that it can serve. It remains just for me at this point to uh, thank the researcher who was primarily responsible for this, Liam Dempsey, uh, really did a tremendous job uh, with this report. Most of it is due to, uh, to his very hard work. Um, he showed brought tremendous research skills, tremendous understanding and analytical ability and a great deal of dedication uh, to drafting this report. Um, his, uh, his, his predecessor, uh, Hannah uh, Byrne, uh, did the same, also contributed uh, a great deal to it. And indeed, our director of research, uh, Rebecca Cohen, also made a very, very important and significant contribution to it. Uh, so I hope, therefore, uh, that this report, which uh, a great deal of work has got into, uh, will be of assistance in further developing our sentencing system. Thank you.